So you see my screen now or not? Yes, I can see it. Um, okay. But we see. Um, yes, I do. But it's. So we can see your browser as well as your. Yeah, PowerPoint. we are seeing all your computer. That's better. Oh, now it is. Right. Then, okay. So I'm going to, uh, as uh, Zam said on Monday, my mission today is to give a 101 course on plasmid biology. And which is, uh, I had to select a few things to talk about. And I decided to talk about the conjugation and things like that, plasmids and ICs then replication incompatibility. So that means <clears throat> more or less uh, some of the basic uh, aspects of plasmid biology. So, we, why doesn't it work now? I don't know what happens. My screen is not, Okay, well, I don't know why. Anyway, so the first thing to know about, uh, about what's the importance of plasmids and so on is that, well, because uh, antibiotic resistance is mostly carried by plasmids. Uh, so it is already known that a reduction of antibiotic consumption will not be sufficient to control resistance because of the spread of resistance strains and resistance genes. And that's what my work, uh, my group is working on. So um, the, the probably the most uh, famous plasmid in all uh, ages has been the uh, plasmid of Yersinia pestis, which carries the pathogenic, the, the system for the control of the type three secretion system, which is essential for virulence of a uh, Yersinia pestis and therefore the plague that assolated uh, Europe for many centuries in the medieval ages and before and after. Uh, so what is interesting is that the, the plasmid in Yersinia pestis uh, is virulent because it increases the copy number uh, when it's uh, in the in right environment and then it becomes virulent. Uh, so it's only because the plasmid uh, exists and increases the copy number that the plasmid is vir virulent because uh, carrying the plasmid has a high metabolic cost to the host. And this idea of plasmids being important for, um, for the spread of uh, adaptive genes like uh, antibiotic resistance or virulence and so on. And the cost of having the plasmid is what drives most of many of the discussions in plasmid biology. So what are the pros and cons of having a plasmid or a given plasmid? So I will talk first about plasmid propagation. Right? That is uh, how plasmids move from one strain to another. So the first uh, conceptual um, slide on what is the genetic structure of a plasmid, of a conjugative plasmid. A conjugative plasmid has like, for instance, R388, uh, which is the plasmid we work with. About half of it, it its genome is 34 kb, of which half of it, about 15 genes, uh, are dedicated to transfer to the conjugative machinery. Then uh, replication, the, the region required for the plasmid to replicate uh, is just uh, 1.5 kb. And that's the same for most plasmids. Replications, replication only requires a small segment of a plasmid. I mean, uh, one KB or a little more. And then there are a group of genes here in blue, which are involved in maintenance. 
And that means uh, they are required for protection against other plasmids, for uh, inducing when it's transferred to the recipient to accommodate to the new recipient and so on. And there are many functions which are uh, starting to be known functionally, many genes which are required for these kind of things. So, and then there is the adaptation module which contains the genes which are not related to plasmid physiology, if you want to call it like that, uh, but they are completely external and they are the adaptation uh, module. So that it, this, um, this module is involved in, uh, for instance, in antibiotic resistance, like in A388, there is an integron here, which contains several antibiotic resistances. So plasmids are in, in fact, natural devices for gene propagation. Establishment in new host and heterologous expression of genes. Okay? So they have to be prepared to do this. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how we measure conjugation, how we measure the conjugation frequency, which is not a conjugation, the conjugation rate. Okay? A rate has a different, um, uh, a different formula than a frequency. A frequency is basically when you have uh, cells with a plasmid and cells without a plasmid, which are called recipients, those are called donors. And then when you mix them, some plasmids uh, travel from the donor to the recipient and in the recipient, they are called transconjugates. For, so if you measure on a plate, let's say, the number of T of transconjugants versus donors or recipients, you get the conjugation frequency. So you have that many transconjugants per donor or per recipient. And that's the way frequencies are measured. Rates is a bit more complicated, but there, are, there will be talks on this workshop uh, specific about them. So I don't need to emphasize that anymore. So besides plating, we can do uh, uh, a high throughput conjugation assay, for instance, by using a uh, fluorescent protein like here. And so you have donors which contain a green fluorescent protein under the control of, of a, a T7 promoter, a, a T7 promoter, which is not here. So therefore this gene here is not expressed at all. When you have a recipient like E. coli BL21, which contains uh, the T7 polymerase in the chromosome, when the plasmid goes to the recipient, you see light. And the light you see will be proportional to the conjugation frequency. That's why we can measure um, many, many um, conjugation assays at the same time by using this. Uh, so we do this in uh, 96 well micro titer plates. And we can see, for instance, assay like in this paper, uh, many compounds to see if they are or they were inhibitors of conjugation. And, and we have done this also. Uh, or we have analyzed conjugation, or you can analyze conjugation by calculating conjugation frequencies in natural environments. Like here, uh, when you can, you see uh, that you have a fish here, you feed the fish with food containing a donor and recipient bacteria, and you analyze the conjugation frequency here or here if there's no fish here. And what you find is that in general, when there are fish around, uh, the conjugation frequency is much higher for uh, different plasmids. We tested uh, these two and several others, and the conjugation frequency goes up like one to two logs when there is a fish. That meaning that a conjugation within the gut of the fish makes more efficient conjugation than if it's dispersed here in the, in the liquid of the fish bowl. And we then can test the inhibitors we tested before to see if they work in this uh, by uh, diminishing the conjugation frequency. And we find here that uh, when you have uh, the, the water ecosystem, which is this one, the conjugation frequency is reduced when 
when you have the inhibitor. And the same happens in another experiment in which we used mice and uh, we, we did the experiments of uh, conjugation in mice. So what this means is that we can measure uh, conjugation frequencies by several uh, methods, and this will give you give us some conjugation frequencies uh, that are under different conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this, I pass to the next uh, idea, and is uh, how is the expression of the genes in a plasmid? No? So we here we have plasmid R388, and it contains the uh, 15 promoters. So we took each promoter here, and we cloned in the same expression vector to check what was the strength of the promoter. And you see here in black, are the, for each promoter in black is the, let's say the constitutive ex expression of this promoter. But then when you add R388 in trans to the same, so you have the, the clone plasmid containing uh, the promoter and some reporter gene, and then you add plasmid R3, R388 on top on that cell. And you see that in all cases, if you start here, eh, one, two, three, you see all of them, are completely reduced. So that means they are repressed. So instead of having activators and repressors, plasmids usually have always repressors, at least R388 here. The only gene which is expressed is from this promoter, and this promoter, not casually, is the antibiotic resistance genes. So that means we have a plasmid which is uh, 34 kb, which has like 35 or so genes, and it's only expressing one, which is the antibiotic resistance, because the others are shut down all the time. All the time when the plasmid is growing with the bacteria. But what happens during, con and so, well, that's the, the same idea here, uh, but that we, we, this is just, uh, to show that we have identified the, what is the repressor for each of, of these promoters. But it's not important in this discussion. So here, this is a, a slide uh, you don't need to understand, but just need to listen to what I'm saying. When a plasmid, which has only repressors, uh, shutting down or the expression of all the promoters, goes to a recipient cell, something happens because when the DNA is there, at the beginning, there are no repressors. So then there is what is called an overshoot of expression. So everything is expressed, okay? but when the, when the uh, repressors build up, then expression is already down. So people that study conjugation frequencies or conjugation rates and so on, so they should realize conjugation is usually at low level, but when a donor goes into a recipient, there is a transient uh, uh, state which uh, lasts a few generations, and is all that is uh, is, uh, is uh, explained in this paper. So there are a few generations in which the expression of all the machinery for conjugation is high, so the Plasmid is what is called transiently derepressed. And so it goes, so when one plasmid conjugates, boom, a number of plasmids conjugate around there, and then everything is shut down again. And that should be for modelers and so on, it should be taken into account. I don't know what to say. Okay, so that's so how does conjugation happen? We need to realize or to think of three important protein or protein complexes. One is the relaxase protein, which is the protein that cleaves the DNA at the ori origin of transfer, and it is going to uh, start the function, right? The start the, the action. Mm -hmm. Then we have the coupling protein, which is the green protein here, which is bound to the channel, which is the blue thing, the blue cylinder. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the channel by which 
donors will uh, uh, the DNA will pass through the recipient. So the mechanism by, by which conjugation occurs is like this. First, the relaxes cleaves the uh, cleaves the the donor DNA and well donor and recipient come together because they are uh, put together by the conjugation chunk. Okay? So here the relaxase is cleaving the DNA on the donor and then one of the copies, one of the strands of the DNA binds the coupling protein, which is an ATPase, and it starts pumping the D, well, the, the type 4 secretion system, the channel, is in fact a protein export channel. So the, it, it exports uh, or it uh, moves. So, uh, sorry, I, I have a question about the previous uh, slides. The previous? Yes, uh, yes, the, the question is, um, you said before that um, maybe 40% of the genes um, were um, functionally due to maintenance and some of it uh, um, to replication of the plasmid itself. So isn't it strange that they're all shut down outside of conjugation, that only the um, antibiotic resistance uh, gene was active? Yes, only the, so when you have a plasmid uh, and under vegetative growth, everything is repressed. Repressed doesn't mean there is no protein at all. Repressed means it's uh, 100 times less protein than when the promoter is activated, basically. Okay, uh, okay. so, so these are just low expression, all the maintenance uh, and uh, replication genes. Um, are expressed to low needed. level. Yes, okay. So when conjugation happens, when this DNA enters the recipient, what happens is that here, the repressors, for a time, they are not there because the, the repressors were expressed here and only the DNA passes to, to the recipient. So therefore here, everything will be expressed in a burst for a few generations, maybe two to four generations, which is what takes for the, it depends in, on the growth rate, for the, for the um, repressors to gain the same uh, concentration that they had in the donor cell. Okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, so I continue. So we are here, then the relaxase uh, links to the coupling protein and is exported by the type 4 secretion system, like this, right? So you see the DNA is entering the recipient five prime to three prime, while here, this strand is replicated by the polymerase complex, DNA polymerase complex. So the plasmid in the donor is um, reinstalled. And in the recipient, the relaxase, uh, when it's there, is able to find again the three prime end on the entering strand, DNA strand, and it cleaves and uh, trans is a, a DNA strand transfer reaction, which makes the DNA, this DNA to uh, circle again. This is known in very detail, but I only have this cartoon here to show it. So we have this uh, strand of the plasmid here, and then the uh, replication ma machinery of the, of the recipient cell is able to replicate the, the lagging strand here, right? So, uh, Okay, that's the, the way it happens. So we have here at the end of conjugation, you have two copies of the DNA, one in the donor, one in the recipient. So the plasmid is uh, again intact in the donor and uh, the other goes to the recipient. So the elements of bacterial conjugation uh, are then the most important ones are the, the components of the channel, which are like 12 to 15 or to 20 proteins, depending on the, on the specific plasmid, the coupling protein, the relax and the relaxase, okay? And 
Uh, but all plasmids which are transmissible by conjugation must have a relaxase because the relaxase is the only protein that can cleave the ORT, the donor in the donor DNA to bring about the conjugation. But several, many plasmids, instead, instead of having to code for everything in the, con, in the transfer channel, they code only for the relaxase and maybe the coupling protein. And these are called mobilizable plasmids because they need a helper conjugative plasmid to conjugate, right? So we have the, the key proteins are the relaxase, which is present in all transmissible plasmids, and the typhosuppression system, which is present only in the conjugative plasmids, right? So when if we use the relaxase, as a proxy to a transmissible plasmid. And uh, VIRB4, let's say, is one of the largest ATPase in the Typhoid secretion uh, system. As the proxy for the transfer region, we know that we can, um, we can decide that trans Transmissible plasmids in general will be conjugative if they contain the relaxase and the VIRB4, and they will be only mobilizable if they contain a relaxase but not a VIRB4, right? So when we check the database, like here, it was RefSec, I don't know, 81, that contained at the time uh, 1700 plasmids. And we draw the, the, size, the sizes of the plasmids, what we find is not, um, let's say, um, a, a, a normal distribution, but a um, bimodal uh, shape like this. And that is, and when we check then what plasmids have uh, are conjugative, mobilizable, or not transmissible, no more, we find that conjugative plasmids are in general uh, like uh, 100 kb eh, with a broad distribution here. Mobilizable plasmids are in general very much small, smaller, like uh, 5 to 10 kb. And then there are also very, very large plasmids, which are maybe also already uh, secondary chromosomes or something like that. And then there are these non-transmissible plasmids. That means 50% of the plasmids in the databases are, do not contain relaxases. In some cases, a few is because they lost them. In others, is because they rely on other uh, methods for propagation. But that, that was with seven, uh, 1,700 plasmids. But now we have uh, 20,000 plasmids here in RefSec 200, and the bimodal distribution still holds like this. So that's interesting. So why are there two basic plasmid layouts? Why some plasmids are mobilizable and some plasmids are conjugative, these large ones? And the main reason for this is that uh, being conjugative is very costly, as I explained before. So this, you have this DNA and this DNA, when you express it, it costs a lot. So some plasmids decide it's not important to have all, the, all this if we have the relaxase and can jump on a conjugative plasmid to, to allow us for transfer. So many mobilizable plasmids, which is 50% of the transmissible plasmids, uh, do not have this burden. So when you have this small layout, a plasmid, these plasmids, which are usually less than 10 kb, you have only 4 kb or so dedicated to the mob region, and then the rest can be cargo. You don't need anything else because the replication is again, well, this is a bit complicated, replication of RSF1010, but in general is one protein or none, but it's a fragment of 0.5 kb or 1 kb. So when you're small, you can have high copy number. And small plasmids like coli-1, RSF-1010, and so on, are in the order of 20 copies per cell. 
roughly, very roughly. Uh, while if you're large, like R388, your copy number has to uh, get down a lot. Eh? And, and the copy number of, of uh, large plasmids is usually about one per chromosome. Could be a little bit more, uh, but uh, in general is one. Now that we have uh, the sequences of, of many, many, many genomes uh, of bacteria, you can compare the copy number of plasmids and chromosomes, and it's more or less the same for, for most of the large plasmids all the time. And so, if you if your low copy number you can have uh, or if your low uh, small size you can have high copy number and then you don't require systems of partition, but if your high copy number you require uh, low, high oh, sorry large size uh, you have low copy number and then you require a system to partition between the two daughter cells because if not the plasmid will be unstable and will be lost. And now uh, some uh, detail about what's the difference between plasmid and ICEs. ICEs stands for uh, integrative and conjugative elements. And integrative and conjugative elements, uh, which were thought at the beginning, at least by me, to be a rarity. In fact, there are, we have shown that there are twice as many ICEs than plasmids in sequenced genomes. There are a lot. And in the branches of the phylogeny, they are undistinguishable. So that means that in, in some branch, there can be some plasmids and some ICEs. That doesn't mean that they exchange very, very uh, frequently, but it, under evolutionary terms, it can happen. So when you have a, a a plasmid or a plasmid in a permissive host, it can always integrate in the chromosome. Always not, but uh, any portable region of homology makes this plasmid integrate in able to integrate in the chromosome. Okay? And therefore, you have an ice here. Okay? And the mechanisms of integration is something that um, we can discuss later. Uh, but when it's integrated in the chromosome, it can go to hosts which are non-permissive for uh, plasmid because for instance, it doesn't contain the replication region which is active here. Okay? So a plasmid can always go to a non-permissive host by integration into the chromosome. So I think the interplay between plasmids and ICs is because of that, because they, it, they allow the colonization of non-permissive hosts. In here, they can evolve to be able again to uh, acquire a replication region, which is, as I said, a 1KB region to be able to replicate here or mutate their own replication system. Okay, so uh, very quickly, hmm? uh, there are several ways uh, in which plasmids replicate. Hmm? You have rolling circle here. I, I will not explain. Okay? Rolling circle, you have the um, rep-dependent replication, which is a theta replication, and uh, in which a rep protein interacts with the uh, with the um, with the origin and opens the origin so that uh, the DNA polymerases can uh, can land there. Then there is a strand a strand re a replacement, which is what. RSF1010 does. And then there's this uh, RNA primer replication, which is used by Coli1. Coli1 is a member of the prototype of a family of plasmids, which is the family, the MOP P5 uh, family for us. And it, it, it doesn't require a protein for replication. It, is, it just uses a, a primer RNA, which is called RNA2 which binds to the origin and it helps opening the origin so that the, uh, the DNA polymerase one can start replication here. So coli one doesn't require a protein for replication. That's important. But this narrow host range, uh, coli one. 
So uh, because of replication, plasmids can be incompatible. Two plasmids are incompatible, they, uh, is said when they cannot reside in the same cell. Why not? Because if they have the same organization of the replication machinery, uh, they, the cell cannot, let's say, cannot distinguish between one and another, and then they, they cannot assort independently. And therefore, plasmids, when, when, when they cannot be, uh, in fact, for the cell or for the replication protein, are the same plasmid, there is random selection of the DNA molecules for replication and, and, for, and in partition and in uh, div cell division. And therefore the plasmid becomes uh, unstable and it disappears one or the other, right? So then these two plasmids are said to be incompatible. Yeah, about a partition, I, I will only say that uh, it's always an, there's always an ATPase and, uh, and uh, another protein which binds to the to a partition site. Eh? In most cases, it's like that. Eh? And there are different families used by different plasmids. But in general, you can say that the, 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 the mechanism is similar. And is, there are mechanisms by which the two, the copies of the plasmids are moved to the, let's say, the poles of the cells or separated between them so that they can uh, then uh, be, be stable, inherited, even if you have only two copies, because one will go to one side, one will go to the other. Eh? And the system is about uh, two, three KB, uh, which is required to do that. Okay. And the last section I'm going to talk about is because is about plasmid costs. As I said, uh, having a plasmid is costly for the cell. So there has, be, has to be reasons for the plasmid to stay there. And there will be all kinds of interactions between plasmid chromosome, plasmid and plasmid and so on. Eh? Uh, and, and the different plasmids, that's the important thing about this uh, slide, is that the, uh, everything which is involved here in the excision or insertion of plasmids in chromosome, interactions between plasmids, entrance or persistence of the plasmid in one strain will be more or less different and specific of each uh, plasmid or PTU as I call them, right? And it's important to, to know this because there will be differences, very important differences between different plasmids. You can find something which happens for one plasmid and doesn't happen for another. For an example that comes to mind, uh, that came to mind when I was preparing this, was the example of liquid versus surface matrix. Some conjugation systems allow the plasmid to be transferred when the cells are in liquid. And these are called liquid matrix. The example is plasmid F or R1, R100, and so on, uh, which is very good because you can transfer in the middle of a growth. While most plasmids are only surface matrix, that means that they need to be together on a surface of a biofilm or a plate or whatever, an agar, agar plate. So in close contact, so that they can transfer the DNA, probably because the links, the bridges between donors and recipients are brittle. Uh, so liquid mating is a, a, an important uh, invention. And it was invented at least twice. One is in the MOBF class, and another one, uh, in, in particularly the MOF the MOB F12 family, which is the family of F, many PTUs in the Enterobacteriaceae, and in the I plasmids, like I1, I, I1, and so on, and other PTUs around that. And these two can transfer in liquid. The others have to transfer on surface, and, and the um, MOB H as well have, has invented this liquid conjugation. And so that is a radically different uh, 
ecology eh, of these plasmids with respect to others. So the success, I think, of the F-like plasmids in Enterobacteriaceae is because of a uh, liquid making. And that's something that maybe in the talks after that will be stressed. And um, as will also be uh, spoken uh, later on, uh, there are me many mechanisms of affecting plasmid fitness that I have no time to, to uh, talk about here but you all know about CRISPRs, about restriction modification systems and so on that in, impede uh, some uh, trans plasmids to be transferred to recipients. For instance, when we took in one experiment, I think it was like 200 clinical isolates of uh, enterobacteria and we transferred plasmid R388 eh, compared to the uh, lab recipient DH5 alpha, eh, 80% of them transfer to frequent at frequencies 10 times lower or much lower than that in 80% of the cases. That means uh, there are many barriers in recipients to the uh, conjugation of plasmids, and we can discuss that later. So uh, this, these are some of the barriers like restriction, CRISPR-Cas, bacteriocins, exclusion systems and fertility inhibition. And I will only uh, put an example on this. Fertility inhibition is when a plasmid he, uh, interferes in the transfer of a co-resident plasmid. For instance, uh, FIPA is a protein produced by inken plasmids that makes INP plasmids non-transferable and so on. And you can see here how many each plasmid has many systems eh, to avoid competition with other plasmids. Eh? And that's only fertility inhibition. I told you there are many barriers. One of them is fertility inhibition. And eh, you have an idea of the complexity of the interactions and the plasmid wars eh, because of this. OK, so I think I, I wanted to uh, finish now because uh, my time is out. Uh, just to acknowledge the people in my lab, and uh, that's all I wanted to say for the moment. Uh, are you still there, or have you all gone? We're here. That was fantastic. Clack, 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 clack. Okay. Quite, I quite like to watch it all again. I don't know if he, I was. I maybe I wanted to. Uh, cover uh, too much of, uh, of the field, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea that uh, plasmid biology has some complexities. Uh, so a plasmid is not just a circle that you can put here and there. Okay, anyway, that's it. Well, that's great, thank you very much. Um, Are there you're any sharing, questions? You're sharing yourself, aren't you? <laughs> I don't have the chat here. Yes. We, Yi Qing Wang has the hand raised, right? If you want to say something, okay, good. Yes, I have a question. Thank you very much first. Uh, my question is about uh, during the conjugation, once the single strand uh, DNA from the donor cell entered the recipient cell, so there's uh, some genes which are required for establishing the new incoming DNA in the recipient cell, like uh, single strand DNA binding protein and uh, the protein PSIA, PSIB for the SOS reaction in the recipient cell. So yeah. my question is, are there uh, other unknown function protein maybe, or the mechanism is already very clear? Uh, is there any protein we need to explore more? Uh, in the maintenance re region of uh, R388, which is one of the smallest conjugative plasmids, there are 12 proteins. One is an SSB, uh, and there are others uh, which have apparently unknown functions, and they are not required for, tra for transfer between E. coli and E. coli in the lab but maybe they are required in some other, uh, for instance, some of the anti-SOS 
proteins that you talk about that are, for instance, in the, and that's very important, in the I, uh, PTUI1 and, and similar plasmids, uh, they are involved in transmission to recipients which are of different gen genera. That was uh, already uh, known by Brian, uh, published by Brian Wilkins many years ago. Uh, so, you know, these proteins won't be essential for transfer between E. coli, but they will be essential for transfer. Uh, and there are some anti-restriction systems in E. coli or in, in several plasmids. And, and I'm sure there are many to discover, many functions, but they won't appear essential in every case. You know, it will be maybe for transfer here or there. For instance, we know uh, RP4 and other plasmids like R388 have very few restriction sites for their size. So you would expect a number of restriction sites and they are known. So that means that they are able to conjugate to strains having type two uh, restriction systems because they won't be affected. And in fact, it's known that uh, they transfer better to uh, strains that contain those restriction systems. And, and in general, there, there, uh, you can bet there will be many functions like this, uh, but the thing is that we don't know uh, in what uh, cases these proteins will act. So it's worth pursuing this system. Problem is you will find one with a lot of effort while bioinformaticians are all, all the time having results eh, without doing anything. So functional genomics with functional plasmid genomics is now uh, a, a, a field of very much sacrifice. So I abandoned it some time ago. Well, I do something, but, but not me, uh, people working with me, but uh, I like, bioinformatics now more. Is this <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So uh, I don't see, ah, okay, there are, hands? Connie, I have mm -hmm. your. Connie okay. okay, yes. So I enjoyed your talk very much, Fernando. And I really liked uh, that uh, in the last part of your talk, you addressed this aspect that some plasmids uh, transfer much easier uh, on surfaces, others more in liquid. And actually, in 1996, we have published a paper from a study where we introduced E. coli carrying either in W, in N, in P1, in F, or in I into a soil microcosm together with a recipient. And interestingly, and the recipient was an E. coli, and we mm -hmm. followed the transfer. And it was very interesting because the conditions were actually the same. The donor background was the same. The recipient was the same. And we did not see any transfer for ink F and ink I, mm -hmm. really uh, supporting what you said. And we saw very high frequencies, for instance, for ink P1 or ink W or ink N. And at that time, and this is what I wanted to add, we speculated a little bit that uh, the pilot shape might be responsible for this ecologically interesting aspect mm. because uh, the long flexible pili like ink F, they are more efficient in liquid than these mm. short rigid ones. Uh, and so, I'm not so sure, and this is my question now to you, is there any new data on this? because at that time we felt this is quite intriguing because it helps us to predict in which environments, which type of plasmids are more important. But the plasmids you used were uh, uh, wild type plasmids? No, like, it was, uh, for instance, your plasmid, ink N. <laughs> so we, we used 3D PKM plasmids. PKM-101, PKM-101. Or RP, RP4. Are, let's say natural plasmids, mm -hmm. but for instance, uh, R1, R101, which is what people use for F, is a de-repressed plasmid yeah. of R, R100. Mm -hmm. So if you use R100, 
R100 is heavily repressed for transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, and R64 is the same. So in the lab, we always use R100-1, which is a repressed version of R100, or R64 uh, DRD11, for instance. Do, those are the, the ones which transfer to high frequencies in yeah. liquid. Yeah. Uh, in the because in and to the, if you used I don't remember that paper uh, if you use wild type plasmids or not did you use R one hundred the repressed version of uh, no we received this F plasmid and ink I plasmid from uh, Werniger Rode from Helmut Schaper at the time and uh, so I I would have had to look it up as well okay. but because least... one possibility is that. Uh, is that uh, those plasmids were repressed and mm -hmm. therefore you need a high concentration of donors and recipients yeah. to bring about this, uh, this transient the repression. Mm -hmm. But we had a high density because we introduced uh, E. coli donor. In soil, no? And uh, yes, but we did it exactly the same way for the different plasmid types. Mm -hmm. And at least at that time, I thought this is quite cool that yeah, yeah, eventually yeah. this plasmid pilus type or shape is influencing the efficiency to transfer. So, but uh, you're right, maybe also repression might be play a role, but I, I will send you the paper because or, or, I still or like it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, well, I I probably read it long time ago. <laughs> And, and it was fine. But what you say, and that's very interesting, maybe, you know, the pilos or the pili of the F and I, they stick to something else. Mm -hmm. And then they are not good for this transfer in soil, you see, because in soil you have many interactions, absorption to things, to the material of the of the soil and so on. Yeah. And so, but of, of course we worked in the rhizosphere. So it's a particular uh, soil, which is yeah. metabolically active because of the root exudates. Yeah. So, but um, this but that would be interesting to see, you know, what, yeah. what are the, the effects of a soil on the transfer efficiency of different yeah. plasmid types? Yeah. yeah. As far as I know, Nobody has done that, mm. uh, but I don't read that much. Anymore. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're like bioinformatics no more. <laughs> uh, another yeah. point on, uh, if I uh, may, yeah. uh, uh, sure. what I really think uh, fitness, I know there are more talks to come, but yeah. I, I always think that fitness cost of plasmids for hosts that live, for instance, in the environment are not that high as typically in an LB broth where you have rapid growth because mm. generation times in soils or in the rhizosphere, they are about one to two days or even more. So uh, I do not believe that fitness cost is that type of an issue. I mean, for bloodstream infection it is, but not mm. in the environment uh, mm. where you have less growth. So that's yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks. But nice we are talk. Yeah, the plasmids, I mean, like F and uh, uh, R64 or I1 plasmids, uh, they are residents of, of Enterobacteriaceae I know. that grow in the gut and grow quickly, well, relatively. But we find them so. also on the leaves, as I said yesterday. Yeah, okay, yes, and, yes. Uh, they so. are, I, I do not believe that you have rapid growth like in an AB broth. Mm, yeah, sure. You're right. Okay. Okay, let us have this Marco Consentino as a question as well. Uh, hi, thanks. So I had the curiosity. Basically, you showed us that there's a lot of interactions towards the end of your talk between plasmids that I could define as ecological. But, and, but um, I don't know if you agree. So that's, I guess, the first question. Um, but they are, they seem to be mostly negative. So is there, uh, like, are there examples of more mutualistic interactions, like uh, um, pairs of plasmids, for example, that are codependent and they are only found uh, together because they um, uh, complete each other genes? 
uh, uh, in terms of functions or um, other examples of mutualism between plasmids? Well, for instance, mobilization in itself is a kind of a positive interaction, right? Uh, an extreme case of positive interaction. Uh, I think the way in which these experiments, in, because this is a summary, this was that cartoon was a summary of many, many papers, but in general, people have looked at when a plasmid, a coresident plasmid is there, is affecting transfer in a negative way, because in a positive way, it was difficult to see at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, now, okay. I don't know now of any instance of a positive interaction, but there was a paper by Gamma et al. Uh, in which they consider positive interactions. Let me see if I find the paper here. So, but, so you don't exclude that they could exist, but it's just the field. Uh, is you know, in different. biology, I am sure everything exists. All the possibilities will be uh, used by some guy or another. Because, you know, you see, a, but the point is, why you would like to help others to be transferred? What's the logic behind that? Um, oh. No, but maybe you, uh, you basically, maybe it's not about transfer, but it's more about presence. Like you wanna be both present in the same species because then you you have you get a fitness increase if yeah, the yeah, other yeah. plasmid okay. is, is also present because that the you know you can uh, carry out functions that would not be possible alone yeah. for both of them that that i'm sure it happens because i remember there is a paper i have to remember if it's alvaro or somebody else that they see that a uh, coli one like plasmids and other plasmids, there is a positive correlation. So uh, strains containing a large plasmid are more, are more likely to contain a coli one than strains that do not contain this large plasmid. I don't know if Alvaro is here and can answer this question because I think it was one paper of his. It's in Ismi Journal 2014, yes, from Alvaro. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. You see, it's important to have this uh, background information. So this, for, for cooperation, I'm sure there are many interactions like this, which are positive interactions. Hey, thanks. And I remember that one, but I don't think in that paper or even later, they uh, really knew the reason for, by, why this happened. They didn't, right? No, Francisco Dionisio also published, right, with Gamma also on, on yes, this topic. Yes, Dionisio, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, are, they, they look at many, many plasmid, plasmid interactions, and it was a very nice paper. It was published in Plasmid, I think, in the journal, but uh, it contains very uh, interesting data. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Then we have a break now or no, no break? Alice? What do you think? Hey guys, I don't know if you were asking for me or- Oh yes. I kind of we heard that. Have... Okay, so you know the question or not? I, I, didn't, I didn't get the question, no. Okay, so the thing is, Marco Consentino asked if uh, are there instances in which there are positive interactions between plasmids, not okay. only because I talked about fertility inhibition and so on, and they were all negative interaction. And yeah. I remember yeah. one paper of yours, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, we, we look at that, yeah. So there's also a paper from Isabel Cordo where they found what it, their paper and our paper, we both look at um, fitness effects of plasmids and, and looking into possible um, epistasis, um, between the fitness effects of, of different coexisting plasmids. And what we found, we found instances of 
positive epistasis between uh, plasmids in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, meaning that carrying two plasmid costs less than you would expect by their independent cost um, in isolation in the same in the same strain. And the Isabel, they kind of found similar things. They, they found both positive and, and, and negative epistasis. And what we did, we look into the databases to like, like genomic in, in, into the genomes in databases, because we kind of predicted that if positive epistasis is common, then we would find um, um, plasmid coexisting beer being more common than you could expect just due to chance. And we found that obviously there are other reasons for, for that to happen, but, but, but we found that. Um, yep, yeah, and it's an ISMI paper. I think I think the, the link is in the in the chat now. Somebody put the link there, I guess. Okay. And Isabel's paper was a plus genetics paper. But you don't know the mechanism, no, for the coli no. one positive thing. In this case, we had we had we didn't we didn't uh, okay. we don't know at all. No. Thanks. Okay. More. Anything else? So then we, what do we do, Alice? 